Good morning, good afternoon, or maybe good evening for those of you watching at night. Uh, welcome to the fourth uh, webinar of the Everest project. So we have a series of webinars. Um, and this webinar is about domain specific languages for heterogeneous and emerging computing systems. My name is Jeronimo Castrillon, and um, I'm gonna be giving this webinar together with uh, Felix Vitva and Carl Friebel, who are researchers in my group at the TU Dresden. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, some of you might have already seen some videos in this channel about the Everest project. So the Everest project is a, is a large European uh, funded project where we're looking into design environments that simplify the programmability of these kind of systems that we, that we have today, where you see convergence between high performance computing, big data analytics, and for instance, machine learning as a, as a subset of that analytics. Uh, and the focus of this project is um, how to target heterogeneous systems, for instance, maybe including reconfigurable um, accelerators, uh, systems that are distributed and scalable. So you have a system that where you can deploy this application on a system that grows from, from a smaller system at the edge and into a larger system in the data center, and also, also to um, support secure systems, um, as we'll be actually discuss in a, in a webinar coming up soon. So this is an example of, of the kind of application that we looked into uh, the project, and I'm gonna give more details about the use cases later on. So this is a picture of weather forecasting uh, from the Chima Foundation or, or weather modeling, better said. And so the goal of this project is to see how can we allow programmers to seamlessly use things like the cloud of PGA system that you saw in another webinar, right? Um, and so you can imagine that um, people doing weather models are not really experts on FPGA systems, let alone um, FPGA systems that are uh, network attached. So in order to, to kind of bridge this gap, we need in this project a set of tools that bring those, those that, that software closer to the hardware automatically. An example of such tools, for instance, are high level synthesis tools. And there is a webinar on this from um, Politecnico di Milano on the tool called Bamboo, right? Where it's, which means that you can now write software and from that software specification, hardware is generated. So that's easier than writing um, a hardware description language directly, okay? So in this webinar, we're gonna be talking about high level programming to kind of reach further up to domain experts, because um, even if you use HLS tools, you still need to know about um, hardware concepts so that you can really use pragmas intelligently, right? Um, so now the idea of this webinar is, can we use high level programming abstractions uh, to help reach, bridge this gap even further? And so that people really working on, on numerics for, for weather simulations can really exploit uh, complex systems like uh, the cloud of PGA system you saw before. Okay, so this is kind of the agenda for this webinar. I'm gonna give you a bit of more background uh, on, on what we mean when we say high-level abstractions. Um, then we're gonna talk about the use cases briefly. And then uh, Felix and Carl will um, walk you through some examples to kind of demonstrate uh, what I'm gonna be talking about um, in, in real life with, with tools and, and compilers. And then we'll just sum summarize this, this talk. Okay, so what do I mean with, with abstractions? Why would, do we need new abstractions? So say we want to code something like this, and this, this, this math that you see here is actually a very common notation for discovering kernels. This is actually an interpolation kernel. So if you give this code to a naive programmer, and, and really a naive programmer, and don't want to insult many of you here, which are uh, experienced programmers, then they might come up with code that looks like this. So this is actually nicely looking code as it's very simple to read. And it's kind of a one-to-one -one translation from the mathematical expression into C code. Now, if you give this code to a compiler, internally the compiler looks at this code into in forms of graphs. So here you have a control flow graph with annotated um, data flow edges, like what's, what's being produced and who is consuming uh, that data. And this graph is already, so it looks complex, but this has been already simplified so we can really put it into, into this slide. Um, and the idea here is that you have to think about how, how difficult it is for the compiler to look at this graph, uh, analyze all those edges and recognize that what the programmer wanted to write was this mathematical expression, okay? So I, I hope you, you agree with me that that's, that's gonna be tough. And since that is tough, it's gonna be difficult for the compiler to understand what kind of things you can do here with, with the math, right? So for instance, it's gonna be difficult to understand that he could actually um, use distributivity and associativity properties of, this, of these expressions to maybe reduce the computational complexity of the code that it generates, okay? 
And so what happens is that if you pass this code to the compiler, you will get a performance that is really, really far away from what um, an experienced programmer will achieve. And indeed, an experienced programmer would write something like this, right? So here you see a very different structure of the for loops. The code looks more complex. I mean, at least it's longer. Um, you see also that there are some annotations for uh, vectorizations of SIMD, SIMD execution, and also some pragmas for open B uh, parallel for loops. And um, we are not exaggerating when we say that the difference in performance from those two codes that you see in the slide could be of 100x, actually it was like 110x, right? So yeah, so that's, so a, a compiler here clearly misses opportunities for parallelization and misses opportunities for, to simplify and, and to reduce the mathematical complexity of the operations that are in the end executed by the CPU. Okay, so that's kind of the general idea of what we want to get at. So we want to be able to, to get to this code from a description that is higher level than this description here. Okay, that's where DSLs come to play and, and DSLs are popular um, worldwide. So I, you'll find uh, plenty of examples in the literature. Uh, now in this presentation, we're gonna be talking about what kind of information do we want to leverage uh, to support some of the use cases? And in particular, you're gonna be relearning about a coarse grain data flow, right? So, so not this, this very fine grain data flow that you see in this graph, but a, a coarse grain data flow that allows you to do optimizations for, for entire nodes in, in a computing system. And, and that's something that is common in the areas of big data and machine learning. And then also we want to um, give the compiler information about algebraic properties of mathematical operators in the area of uh, numerics and, and computational uh, simulations. Okay. Um, also a takeaway here is that once you use these high level abstractions, it is easier and, and possible to generate multiple variants. And what you see in this slide are actually even further simplified graphs of the type of computation that we had before. Every graph here is a, is a real compiler graph that implements the same computation that you saw before, right? That interpolation that I mentioned. And so generating this, this variance from a DSL representation is very, is very simple it is way harder to move between variants, right? And that's what in principle we're asking a traditional compiler. We're asking a traditional compiler that given a graph like this, please do a sequence of analysis, sequence of transformations so that you reshape that graph into something that, that looks like this one in the upper right corner. And some of you might have some background compilers. You, you should, um, you, you have a feeling of how difficult it really is in compilers to achieve such um, really control flow data flow transformations that are required to create all these shapes of graphs. Whereas in a generation perspective, when we start going from a DSL, that's um, kind of simple. Okay, let's uh, talk a little bit more about the use cases in the project. So here you see three major use cases that we use in the project and some of the partners that are leading these activities. There is also a loop down here uh, from a presentation or a, actually a session uh, where these use cases were discussed in detail. Um, but just to give you an idea, so one example is this one of renewable energy prediction, uh, which means for instance, now we need information from the HPC simulation about what's gonna happen with the wind so that um, once we know what's gonna happen with the wind, maybe we can do more intelligent management of our wind farms, right? Another use case is air quality monitoring here as well. You need um, you, you need modeling of uh, dispersion of, of um, elements in, in, in air and also information about, about uh, winds and, and so on in the atmosphere. And the last one is this one of traffic modeling, which here, for instance, you, you could also use information from, from weather. You can also use information from the different cars that you have in the system in the city. And um, ideally you would like to have like a, like a global coordination of the traffic within a city. And for that, you need a lot of um, grabbing information uh, using models to predict behavior and then making decisions, okay? And so in this, in this use case that you see here, we see uh, irregular data flow kind of uh, patterns, right? It's not really just simple data flow or, or, or embarrassingly parallel kind of applications. For some of these applications you need, uh, you have certain degree of data flow, but some of these nodes that are computing, for instance, routes, uh, require some state. And this is shown here with this blue, with this, with these yellow boxes. 
And some of that, that state is shared across, may, maybe shared across nodes. So now we need to be able to capture this uh, to tell the compiler um, what are the constraints so that the compiler can maybe increase the parallelism without violating uh, or without inserting data raises on that shared state. On the HPC side, as, as you might have expected, here we have um, from, from the weather simulation areas, but also computation fluid dynamics, we have um, a lot of numerical algorithms, a lot of tensor expressions, stencils, and these kind of things. And um, there's a lot of decision making here, for instance, uh, for uh, and also modeling with machine learning, for, for example, for, for traffic prediction, but also decision making, for instance, in, in, in the wind farm use case that I mentioned before. Okay, so these are kind of the use cases in the Everest project. And our responsibility within this project is to kind of help with um, abstractions and compilers so that some of uh, some components of these use case can be automatically lowered to heterogeneous um, systems. So in this webinar, we're gonna be talking about the first two use cases. The third use case, uh, machine learning, or not the use case, but pattern machine learning will be discussed um, in, in future podcasts and in future webinars. Okay, so let me give you kind of a heads up about what's, what's coming up when um, Carl and, and Felix present you uh, the details. So first, the first thing, as I said, is, is data flow. And in particular here in data flow, we want to have implicit data flow, meaning that we don't want um, the, the domain expert to be creating really data flow nodes and, and edges, right? Like using a graphical pro programming um, environment. Uh, we want to provide a comfort or the illusion of writing something imperative and sequential. And um, the, the nice thing about this is that if you write this sequentially, and, and so you can actually test it in, in, a, in a single thread, and by since the compiler ensures semantic preservation, once we deploy this in parallel um, and concurrently, then we can be sure that the functionality will remain the same. Okay. Another important aspect of this of this language is that actually we support multiple different languages as starting point, as you can see in this figure over here. So we have, for instance, a, a language flavor that looks like Rust, so we call Rust minus minus, a language flavor, flavor that looks like Python, so it's like Python minus minus. So this makes it easier for the domain expert that is already using Python to write this particular piece of the, of the software in Python using some restrictions. Right? So some of you with background compilers, you know that it is really, really difficult to extract parallelism out of um, like general sequential pr uh, programming languages like C or Java. So that's why we restrict and we provide some guidelines as, as long as these guidelines are respected, we are able in the, in the compiler to extract this coarse grain data flow graph that I was mentioning before. And once we have that, then we can high level data flow transformations that are really difficult to do if you start at a lower level, say for example, everything is C. Right, examples of those transformations are, for instance, batching. So you batch uh, calls to I/O to reduce latency. Right, if you have a database or something behind it, um, or you want to do a uh, coarse grain pipelining of of this um, of these actors. Okay, the second thing that you're going to look at today is exactly the one that handles those mathematical expressions that I were that, that I was talking about before. Uh, so it's kind of a language with, with which you can describe these expressions. Uh, this compiler is built atop MLIR, which is a uh, recent framework for um, devising and designing language abstractions and how these language abstractions uh, connect to each other in kind of a seamless lowering compilation flow. And so here, um, the language now, if this is what, it, what, what you wanted to write, now the language is very close to that math expression. You see that here. And this is just one incarnation of that language. We have also syntax that looks closer to C++. Um, but anyway, so here the, the hash, hash, hash is actually representing the products that are happening here with these tensors. And uh, the numbers that you see here is just telling the compiler which dimensions are supposed to be contracted with which dimensions, okay? And actually what you saw before is code that we generate from this expression we code we generated the code that you saw before with the OpenMP pragmas and the CMD annotations. Good, so now that once we, once we have the CSL, uh, you see there is nothing really uh, special about uh, annotating anything about uh, how to run this on hardware or how to run this uh, in the CPU. And with our compiler, we can generate code to execute efficiently on mainstream um, x86 kind of processors, um, bus attached FPGAs, and we're working on how to generate code also for the cloud FPGA system that you saw in another webinar. Um, 
yeah, so, so this is what I said is for the HPC, we can generate the code that you saw before, and this will be demonstrated as well. And, um, and for the FPGA, we can actually deploy multiple such kernels on the FPGA system. With that, I'd like to um, hand over to, to Felix, who will be talking about this DSL and compiler for cross-grain data flow, and we'll reconvene when we get back to the summary. So now I'm going to show you how our language framework can be used to develop data flow-based applications. And I want to motivate this a bit by looking at one of the use cases we have in the Everest project, which is the traffic simulator. As Heronimo has said before, this is an application that aggregates information from various different sources to train a probabilistic model for the traffic in that certain area, which we can then in turn use to make more informed decisions about traffic routing in the future. And here I want to take a closer look at the actual routing component that uses the probabilistic model that we trained beforehand. So if I ask this application for a route to a specific destination, it will first select a number of different routes that in theory would all get me to this certain destination, uh, but it will then annotate those routes with uh, the estimated travel times those routes will entail. This is what's called probabilistic time-dependent routing. And the algorithm will then select, based on certain criteria, usually time, the best route and will then send it back to me as the end user. And a slightly simplified algorithm for this application would look like this. So first, for a specific route, we would compute the baseline travel time, which disregards any possible delays on the, on the road. And then we will use our probabilistic model to um, calculate several times the delays that could occur on that route based on the time of day I'm traveling. Um, this is then in fact wrapped into another loop that does this type of computation for a range of different starting times. So, and this is an application that we want to implement using our Dataflow DSL to get more performance and also to enable us to deploy this to heterogeneous hardware. And the tool that we have for this job is the Uhura compiler framework, which as Heronimo has outlined before, is a source to source compiler that exploits implicit parallelism hidden within an application. The compiler uses it as input files code that is basically just a restricted subset of the Rust programming language. That is all notably, or most notably, that code is also sequential, which means that it does not contain any notion of parallelism. This code is then by the compiler uh, turned into a data flow graph, which our compiler itself then reasons on and uh, transforms and optimizes. In the end, this uh, data flow graph representation is then mapped back to Rust code that will then include a parallel runtime and can execute in parallel. Uh, in order to show you how those restrictions look and how you would actually implement such an application, I'm now going to switch to the editor and show you. On the left side, you can now see the actual delay profile function that I outlined as a bit of simplified code beforehand. And this is actually part of the PTDR kernel. And um, maybe for starters, we can even execute this with a bit of dummy data uh, to verify that it indeed works. As an input here, I'm using uh, some traffic data that has been accumulated for the Czech Republic. And I'm just trying to plot a, a single route starting in the morning. And as you can see, uh, computing the probable delays for that route took about 700 milliseconds. Um, and okay, so let's actually transform this function into something that the Uhua compiler can actually process. And what the Uhua compiler will do, it will take this function and it will transform this into a data flow graph first. And one notable thing about data flow graphs is that sharing data between individual nodes is something that does not work. Consequently, we cannot use any uh, references in the body of our function or even in the function signature. So this is something that we would have eliminate first. So to do that, I'm actually first just going to remove those uh, ampersands here to 
remove those operators, even also from the function signature, because obviously supplying a shared reference as argument to a function is also something that will not work then, because in the end, as we will see later on, the Ohura compiler will transform this piece of code into a elaborate runtime that then um, does uh, that actually takes those input that input data and sends it to the respective data flow operators, which will then in turn produce output that will set, be sent to the next operator in the data flow graph. So using references here also will not work. We need explicit ownership of the data that is being given to the function. Uh, but as you can see, all so at least this uh, this restriction here that we have to place on the code is something that just originates from our use of a data flow graph as an internal as an, as an internal representation. But something that we can do relatively easy here is to in, in order of course in order to avoid uh, unnecessary costs of copying and cloning data is to actually wrap the data structures that are a bit more uh, memory intensive into an ARC, which is an atomic reference counter pointer in Rust. And they offer a very cheap abstraction uh, for data that is read only because you can safely share those reference counted pointers between threads. And this offers us, an, as I said, a very, very cheap way of using the data in or handing owned uh, own pieces of data to several uh, data flow operators without having uh, to clone the underlying data structure if it's not necessary. So for that, I have to use here the uh, atomic reference count pointer, of course. And I'm also explicitly, I'm also going to wrap this, uh, the probability profile, which is probably the biggest data structure that we have in the PTDR kernel into this ARC because we want to avoid having to clone this uh, probability profile at all costs. Um, okay, so now we can see that the compiler is not happy about the uh, way we have we are now using the drive function. And so let's fix that next. First of all, I'm going to move this no limit probability profile that we're using here out of this, uh, out of this function invocation just to make it a bit easier to read. Um, actually, this function call here um, gets us the baseline travel time uh, or baseline it was called in the simplified algorithm version. So this is basically the time it will take to drive that specific route if there is no delay um, on the road. So let's move that uh, up here um, and wrap that into an ARC now as well because we are doing the same thing down here for the probability profile. So we are calling the function with an uh, ARC wrapped probability profile here. So we would obviously have to do the same thing here. So uh, let's do that. And again, there it is. Okay. So now just remove that and use the no limit here. Good. Now let's first fix those. Uh, let's let's fix the, the the drive invocation here. So for that, I'm going to jump over to the route.rs file, and here we have the the drive function. And as we can see, we're up until this point we took uh, three references as inputs, which doesn't work anymore right now. So first, I'm going to remove the uh, first and last reference because. We just change those into ARCs and the same thing will have to happen here. Now for the departure time, we could actually also wrap that data type into an atomic reference counted pointer. But as we as developers of this, of this application may know or may have seen is that we're actually, we, so we are taking a shared reference to that data structure, but down here, we are then transforming it back into an owned reference uh, or into an owned piece of data. So we can just remove that in direction here and just take this step a bit earlier by just providing a owned piece of data from the start. So let's remove that. Okay, 
And this should actually be it for modifying this function. So we, we get as input here the route, which we are then using by calling the advanced function with the dot operator, which automatically dereferences this ARC pointer, so we're fine. The only thing we will have to do is modify this prop profiles and hand it over as a reference. Okay, this should be it for this function. All we now have to do is at the top of the file to add the import for the um, for the ARC as well. Remember to write it correctly, of course. And uh, let's go back down here. Okay, so with this out of the way, we can save this file and jump back to our delay function. So one other thing that does not really work in your whole compiler as of this point, or that at least will have to be modified is this loop down here. So for those of you that are familiar with a Rust syntax, this looks relatively straightforward. Basically, we have some form of iterator here that gives us a certain uh, range of um, samples we are iterating over. And then as part of this uh, function, we're, uh, uh, so for each of those for each of those iterations, we're then uh, calculating a duration using our probability profile as I explained before, and are then computing the, um, the delta time so that the, the actual delay uh, that we that we incur when using this route. So we'll have to rewrite this into an actual for loop because uh, our compiler is at this point just not able to comprehend what exactly happens in this, those types of iterators, mainly because those can be uh, can be chained at will. So for, theoretically, you could also apply a filter function here now and filter out specific results. And this is, uh, iterators are just uh, a bit too complex in the Rust programming language for a compiler to understand, but this is not re a real problem because we can just um, define a vector here That is at first empty, of course, but then we can uh, iterate over the elements and uh, add the results that, that are produced here uh, to the vector one by one, which is essentially what, what is already written here. It's just a bit more explicit. So we don't care about the iterator uh, iteration variable and are using the sample range function now. And Within the loop body, we're then computing the duration as has been written here. Let me just uh, move that up here to make matters a bit easier. But we'll, what we'll now have to do is we'll have to actually assign this to a, or we don't, but for readability, I'm going to assign this to a dedicated variable here. And then we are pushing that into the uh, result vector by doing this. Okay, so this can now go away and we can instead uh, just return the actual result here. And now, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot a keyword here and now the code should make, make a bit more sense, I'm sorry. Okay, so far so good. The compiler is still not still not happy, but we are getting there. And what the compiler is complaining about now is actually something that we would have had to enforce in the in a data flow graph anyway, because what what's still happening here is that we are sharing data. Uh, we can actually also let the compiler do the talking um, to explain it a bit further. But basically, what is happening here is that we are using uh, that we are using route here. Uh, as a as a as a, as, a, as an owned value, and then we're using this trying to use this value again here, which doesn't work because it has been moved before. So now the Rust compiler, uh, because of the restrictions that we placed on the code beforehand, is actually now helping us uh, to better understand what needs to be done. So the easiest solution for that is, of course, to just clone this data structure. This was the reason for wrapping it into an atomic reference counter to pointer beforehand anyway. So we can just do that here and avoid using it after it, had, it has been moved before. 
So now compiler is still not happy. And this is because we're also using the probability profile here and we're using it in an own fashion, which does not work because we're in a loop here. So uh, the second loop iteration would no longer find the probability profile here because it has been moved in the first iteration. So easy solution here as well is just to use an explicit clone call to that function. And there we are. So if we supply this to the Rust compiler again now, we will see that the compiler is indeed happy now with our delay function. But now, of course, we also have to adjust the function that actually calls this delay function. So now we are moving into the uh, into the file that calls this, and this is the actually the actual. Uh, this is called actually from the main function, as we can see here now. So uh, what we have to do here as well is to uh, remove this, uh, remove those references here, one by one, and instead we'll now have to wrap those. Uh, um, We'll now have to uh, wrap the route, for instance, as necessary. I deleted a bit too much there. Not sure how that happened. Uh, it's usually best if you know your editor. <laughs> okay, so now we have to wrap the route up here into an IRC as well. Uh, you see, it's it's mainly it's all it's always the same the same procedure. Uh, there's actually this is one of the strongest limitations that we have that we cannot support any form of shared data. But um, once you understood this principle and uh, once you realize why that is and how you can circumvent that, uh, then it's relatively easy to program with that in mind. And in part, as you have seen before, it's also just then following the, uh, the hints the compiler has given you before. So we have, of course, to um, add the ARC here as well. Good, and this should be enough for the compiler to accept our program. Except, of course, for the fact that I may have mistyped a few things here and there. You may notice that the compilation takes a bit longer than usual. Uh, this is mainly because of me recording my screen at the same time. Uh, so please also take the uh, actual execution times that are reported after uh, the successful computation with a grain of salt. Um, now we let this run. And in the meantime, I'm going to switch back to the uh, delay function that we wrote before. So this is now actually something that the Ahura compiler will be able to digest. Um, we removed uh, any uh, any form of data sharing or borrowing. And this should now be fine to use with the Ahura compiler. And indeed, we're just going to call our compiler now and let it transform this piece of code into uh, a parallel runtime. Um, as you see here now, the time elapse is now at about 3000 milliseconds. Indeed, this piece of code should perform a bit worse than the uh, than, than the original code base, just because we are now cloning data much more and we are using atomic reference counted pointers, which internally also uh, have to do some computation in order to keep the reference count up to date across the threads. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not that bad. This is mainly because of me recording my screen, as I said. And now I'm going to call our compiler Uhuasi and I'm going to let it build uh, our delay, uh, our or delay file here and let it move its output to the output folder. And as you can see here, so indeed we are just supplying this file here as an input. And as you can see, the compiler digested it without problems. And we can now move the generate delay file. And I'm going to move that to generated.rs just to enable us to actually inspect this file. Uh, we can now take a look at this here. So it should now live in source generated.rs. So first of all, there's a lot of stuff going on here. 
we can see a lot of things happening. Let me just show you a few things here and there to give you a feeling for what is actually happening here. So as I said before, the compiler now uh, extracted a data flow graph from the code that we wrote and it has now transformed this uh, into an actual runtime after doing a few optimizations. And up here, this, uh, this block is basically just the creation of all the channels that link the data flow and nodes together. And down here, we have the actual nodes that compose the, that compose the data flow graph. Uh, let me, for instance, take, take this one right here. Um, this one is uh, what was before computing the free flow duration. This has been uh, wrapped into an operator. And as you can see, it receives as an input uh, our route here, which is called var zero. And the uh, as var two, the no, probability, uh, the no limit probability profile. Um, it has also been given the departure time here. This is something that uh, works because the departure time is actually supplied as an argument and the date time structure here supports uh, copying, which allows us to move it into several, uh, several scopes um, without having to clone it explicitly. And we're now computing here. So this line is doing the actual computation before we then send out the result uh, into the rest of the data flow graph. And maybe we can also take a look at the other drive function, which is living down here. And here you can see uh, something, uh, one of the optimizations that we are doing is we identified that this drive function is actually, it, so it's being called in a loop, but it's actually a stateless function. So it doesn't use or modify any state. So something very simple that can be done uh, about this is to execute this in, uh, in a data parallel fashion. And we are doing this uh, using a work stealing runtime that you can see being constructed over here. So we are using the Tokyo runtime, but this is really something that is completely interchangeable. And yeah, so you see that this, this computation here of this drive function is then moved into an asynchronous scope and is being computed and is then, um, is then evaluated as needed when the data flow graph is then actually polling for the results later on. Okay, so I guess this was it uh, for showing what, what actually happens here. Now I'm going to, of course, also add this file to, uh, to our librs to enable us to actually try it out. So I'm going to add that here. I'm going to add this generated here. And then we're using this one instead of the original delay function in our prop delay file here. So instead of that, I'm going to use generated dot prop delay, but we of course also have to add that here. Good. Now let's try this. Let's run that again. Good. So this worked. I just uh, skipped a bit over the compilation process because it took a little while to actually compute uh, to actually compile the Tokyo runtime here. Um, but as you can see now, um, our uh, execution time is now down from what was before 4000 milliseconds now down to 1756 milliseconds. But as I said before, those numbers are nowhere near the uh, real numbers. Uh, by keeping in mind that uh, I'm just recording my screen at the same time, which of course also takes a hit on the performance. Um, but uh, yeah, so as we saw here now, so this is the parallel runtime that has been generated. Those errors have been fixed, by the way. Um, and one other, th one last thing that I wanted to point out is that up here, for instance, now is a constant that regulates the thread count. So this is also something that can be varied. So what what happens, of course, in the uh, in the in the runtime, and that can be seen down here at the end, is that we are constructing all those uh, all those nodes, which are then uh, spawned onto some onto different threads, uh, 
uh, and executed in parallel, but for the uh, Tokyo runtime, so for the actual data parallel part, the uh, thread count that is to be used can be uh, can be varied using this variable up here. Okay, and that's it for the demonstration of how to use the Ahura compiler. Maybe as uh, as as another note here. So this is a rather simple uh, application in a way that it's it directly exposes um, some data parallelism here that the compiler can exploit very easily. But another use case that the Uhuru compiler has been designed for is what is called amorphous data parallelism. And I admit that the example here is not the best to demonstrate this, but you can imagine it in a way that, so for instance, if we had some sort of state here, um, let's, let's call it just like that, just as a dummy, just for illustration purposes, and we had a work list here, and let's just say that that has some, some kind of input. And as part of this loop here, we would, or as, as instead of this loop here, we would actually loop over this work list and update the state with the result of every work list item. Uh, this is something that you can usually not parallelize very easily because this share, this access, this shared state access here, uh, Will, uh, will will complicate matters, but the Ahura compiler is able to exploit some parallelism from this um, just by um, batching uh, several several loops. So just let me give you the example here again. So let's say for item in work list, we are uh, doing doing some sort of computation. Uh, based on the item. And let's say we want to update the state uh, using this uh, this result here. And, and depending on the, and we're then pushing that, that result here to, to this vector rest that we have had before. And we would then, let's say, instead uh, filter that and would receive from that either uh, either an empty list, which would mean that all the items in the work list have been processed, or if some sort of state update may have failed because of um, data that is no longer valid, um, then we would have, still have items in the work list and then we would instead be able to do, um, uh, if that, or we would be able to say that if the filtered, uh, if filtered is not empty, we would then either call this uh, function in that case here, it's delay profile again, using some, using the, using the input of course, or if we would be done, then we could just return uh, our state. So this is, so this is a pattern that is usually very, very hard to pay, may, to transform into a parallel version because of the state update that is occurring here. but what our runtime or what our compiler is actually able to do is um, to just to uh, use a, a few, uh, use a number of items from the work list uh, to, so to transform it into batches and uh, compute a batch of this work list in parallel. So does the, so it computes the work heavy sum computation function here and then tries to apply those state updates in again deterministic order. And because of the explicit retry semantics we have here, this is something that uh, our compiler can exploit. And so the sum computation function would actually be able to be run in parallel. Okay, so uh, that's all I wanted to show here. And now I'm going to switch back to the presentation. As we have seen, using Uhua comes with a number of advantages. First and foremost, it's very easy to write. It requires nearly no reasoning about parallelism whatsoever from the developer. 
He just supplies us with his sequential input program and the compiler will automatically turn it into a parallel runtime. This means that the developer can now verify the correctness of his programming logic using a sequential program first before then moving to the parallel target, which is usually very difficult to debug. Also, at this point, we support a number of well-established languages already. You could also supply us with a Python input file, which we would then in turn transform into a parallel Python runtime. Also, the code that is generated by Ohua does not only execute in parallel, but it is also executing deterministically, which is a uh, property that is usually lost when moving to parallel targets. But as part of the Everest project, we want to leverage the advantages of Dataflow graphs even further. Because our runtime already encapsulates single nodes and the runtime takes care of the communication between those nodes, we could in theory also deploy single nodes to different hardware in heterogeneous contexts. For instance, one of those nodes could then be programmed using a domain-specific language that has been specifically tailored towards kernel development which is something that Carl will show you right now. Now that Felix has shown us how we can approach data flow problems using the compiler tooling that we develop, we want to have a brief look at the computational part, which is all the kernel stuff that Geronimo was talking about. Because after all, the typical HPC workload will combine many of these aspects together, often in a very opaque fashion. And that brings us to our first problem. Usually, users of HPC applications are not at liberty to follow this sort of bottom-up design process that we just described, just to make their application suit their specific needs. In fact, the average user is most likely looking at a very large legacy code base, which most often than not just means that it's not something that they own or that they developed. They are not very likely to be developers or maintainers of the application, and it is very likely that they are also not its only users. It is actually probable that they occupy a very small niche in all of the user base for this application and have a problem that's very specific to them. If you're fortunate enough, this code base is an open source project and you're at liberty to at least inspect and modify it as you want. So let's take a closer look at what we may find and see if that sounds familiar to you. So legacy code does not always mean that the code is old, but it means that these projects that grow over time quite a lot sometimes have parts of code in them that outlive the entire project or steal from other projects. And these few reimaginings that you had along the way make it very difficult to look through. And there's probably lots of Fortran in there too. Now, the whole thing can be very dense, as I just said, even to the point where it becomes unreasonable, almost, to any single developer of the project, and especially to any user of the application, to do any cross-component refactoring in there. So things are mostly set in stone. But sometimes, also because very certain components, as I just said, are imported from other projects or are older, the code has different origins that make it also very heterogeneous in and of itself. So you may actually need an entirely different set of tools to understand code from one part of the project as compared to another. And these sections are then very hard to touch, to modify in any kind of way. And to top it all off, someone probably spent a long time to develop a build system that then pulls all of this together because to them convenience was also important and they wanted their users to be able to actually use their project. Well, and that means that any kind of modifications we do to these projects have to deal with these custom build systems too, meaning we can't make that many assumptions and there's probably not a lot we can do in that regard that is portable. So these are all some problems that we would expect. Does that sound familiar to you? Well, in Everest, we have one of those two. It's the WARF, which is short for Weather Research and Forecasting Framework, which is actually a quite new code base in that regard, but it also combines some very old components. The important part is it's very integral to the majority of our users, and we're trying to enable it in this project. So let's look at it to see how the strategy translates to this. First of all, the good thing is that our users have been working with this application for a very long time. 
So they may not be able to locate and explain all the implementation details that is found in the entire code base. They will actually have a deep understanding of what is happening in the sense of what is being produced, what are the things modeled in this code. And through challenging this application with their particular problem time over time, we had this with the niche, as I said before, they probably also already figured out, and in our case they did, what are the parts that are of interest to them? What are the parts that play the largest role in their use cases? And how would you go about to start trying to improve this project? Well, this understanding of the background behind all of this, and in this case, the atmospheric equations and the systems that are being described, is what makes the user the domain expert. And that is exactly the target audience for our infrastructure. And that is the sort of knowledge that we need. Of course, we can assist them a little bit with that, but whatever happens, the first thing you should probably do is you should quantify what the result of changing in any kind of way, of performing any kind of changes in the code base in particular places are going to be for the result you were expecting. Profiling is one way to do this, just to figure out what is the time requirements. And the reason why we're doing this is we want to have the maximum possible impact with the least amount of work to be done, which is very important for these big HPC applications. So this is just one way of going at it. And I'm presenting this here to illustrate the point that the really important part in the end is that you need to identify a particular component, which we were able to do in this case, with the radiation driver and the RTMG module that you're going to start work on, because you cannot work on the whole thing. And the first step in tackling an HPC application thus becomes reducing the problem, especially if it's an application of this magnitude like WARF, and figuring out these points. And that is fundamentally a job for the domain expert. But you probably knew all that already. And you're still left wondering how does our DSL-based flow actually address all these problems, specifically the one we had on the legacy code base, and what makes it better than doing it by hand if there's still so much work to do? Well, first of all, the heterogeneity that we've been talking about in this project a lot is more of an implementation problem. Ultimately, the goals that the user has formulated for this work are in terms of more tangible goals for their specific results or application. So while this is what we want to have happen, what you can see there, that's not the important part, right? What we are trying to say is that we are going to help the users achieve this without having them pay any extra for it. I think that's the most important takeaway. So first of all, that means that we want to make it as easy as possible to do this translation, which is taking a component you already have and trying to improve upon it by moving it to a DSL. So since WORF is just too big for this presentation, to illustrate this point from now on, I'm going to use a smaller computational fluid dynamics application, a short CFD. And in that case, we identify what this domain is, what's being done there, and try to make a language for that. So in this particular case, it's a very specific subset. However, the upshot of this is, it's very easy, as you will see later, to express something that was very complicated in the original component before in this DSL, and it provides a lot more information than it did before as well. So there is one more part that's related to the implementation, and you will only see that as a user if you've ever tried to do something like this yourself. So if you've ever tried to write OpenMP applications, you know that data locality and where transfers happen and what the layout is, is very important to whatever you're doing. But this is now an implementation detail. And we want to remove all the references that I talked before to a specific envisioned hardware platform that the original project developers had in there and that the user might not want to use. So this needs to be transparent. And with OpenMP, arguably, it's not transparent because, you know, there's still a right and a wrong way of doing it. And we want to get rid of that. And finally, that's probably the most important thing here. We have control over the entire thing. And that means we want to automate everything as much as possible. So in the end, ideally, 
you're just going to have one source if the original code base allows for it with your kernel stuff in there. And you're going to push one button and the entire flow will run going to the target that you specified. And that is really the advantage here that after you did the original translation step, there's nothing else left for you to do than press the button. In the introduction, Geronimo already quickly laid out the things for you that are going to be happening here. But now that we have a look at the concrete components, here's a more concrete example. So we start with the legacy code base that you can see on the left, where a domain expert has already extracted a small piece of it, a small kernel, into DSL. Now, in case of a Fortran application, he can do all of this in the same code base by using the preprocessor facilities in a very unintrusive way that's not going to change this for any other uses of the application. From there, we start extracting. This is where the automation begins. Everything starting with this point is automated. We get two parts of this. Why two parts? Well, obviously we are trying to implement a fast kernel, which is going to be on the upper half of this diagram, but we also need to integrate into the existing code base, which is what I wanted to motivate with the section on legacy code bases. So the first thing that's happening here is that we actually have a small hook in mechanism for your legacy code base that's going to use the least common or lowest common denominator that we could think of for any build system. And that is just having external linkage for some of these components. So that means a runtime library that the compiler provides, including a small stub that is devised from your kernel implementation, will be put in place of the original code in your application to enable us to change how it works. And this is hopefully adaptable to all kinds of different build architectures, but it is certainly for WARF and others that we've considered. Now, the next step is to translate this DSL into something that we can work with. In this case, as you've already been introduced to it, we're using MLIR. The benefits of using MLIR is that as opposed to traditional compilers or just using GCC, for example, um, we're not losing as much domain specific information because we can make a translation and a representation MLIR that preserves it perfectly. And that's very important for the next step, which is the meat of this entire process, and that's optimizing on this representation. This also includes some kind of transformations we do to enable the heterogeneity. And they are, of course, very important, but they then start to need target information. But that is a good thing about the automation this flow. As we have the control over this, we can decide at which point the target is supposed to play a role without the user having to change anything about their input. Well, and finally, as you already seen, we need to go to something that we can execute. There's different platforms we want to support or different targets. Um, this translation step could also mean for the case of some of these components um, that we actually connect to different parts of the flow that are then device specific to leave implementation questions that are too device specific up to those who know best. Um, but obviously we can also use MLIR to interface there to have seamless integration across this entire flow. Now that you've seen what's going to happen, let's look at a small example of how this is implemented for the CFD application I talked about earlier. So let's get to the demo. We're going to do this in a quite simplified fashion. I've prepared a few things, but let's look at it in order. So we've got an existing Fortran application, which in this case is called Specht, which is performing a computational fluid dynamic simulation that has to perform the inverse Helmholtz operator on every time step. This is done as part of the physical simulation to obtain the decomposition of the flow field in the Helmholtz decomposition. So this is the most compute intensive part of this application. This has been identified by our domain experts. And in fact, the work has already been done to extract this. So to test different variants here. And the function we're looking at that performs the kernel fits into this screen. As you can see, there's a few different variables that are being passed. They have a few different parameter types declared. Then this is the code implementing the actual inverse Helmholtz operator. And we want to replace this. We want to provide a different implementation for this. So the first thing that needs to happen is, and which has already happened to the most extent, I'll just 
So the first thing that needs to happen is we have to extract this. We have to provide a different interface that we can bind to. This is the stub. Now I'm going to simplify this a bit further. This is what the stub would look like for a Fortran application. As you can see, I'm only using one instead of three variables here because they're all constant in the program just to simplify things a bit. Now, this will be compiled with our existing application and allow us to link in something that is called kernel in order to replace the implementation of this kernel. Now, this needs to be written in the CFD Lang language. I've already prepared this and we're going to look at it now in comparison to what was originally here. As you can see, the CFD Lang language program is actually quite short. In fact, it's just three lines if we exclude all the declarations. The declarations are kind of doubled up here and are more or less implicit, so in further iterations we're probably going to get rid of them. What's important here is that the original code was performing the same function here, but that's not quite obvious, in fact, because it used already a few optimizations and changes that are more common in these kinds of Fortran implementations, but those obscure the intent a bit can only restore that because we can actually see someone wrote a few comments that tell us what's happening here. But the domain specialist obviously knew what they wanted to do and with CFD Lang we give them the option to do that exactly and directly. So in fact this turns into the sequence of these three operations. The first one is this large expression which is a tensor contraction on this big outer product. Then we have a Hadamard product and then we have another contraction and these differ in the indices. And so we produce the output V from the inputs S, D and U where A, B and C of the original program are all equal to S. Now that was quite simple. Next we are going to look at the actual implementation of this. I have prepared a small script that's going to run the disaggregated automated steps of this so that we can intercept the results and see what happens. The script has now run through and produced a few intermediary artifacts. First, let's look at what it's actually going to do. So because I don't have an accelerator available, we're going to go for a CPU target. That means in the end, the implementing part or the last translation part will use CPU tooling that already exists. In this case, we're using LLVM because that's easily available. The rest before is what we saw on the diagram. Now, the first step we have to do is we need to translate this DSL into our intermediate representation that we can use. We can immediately look at that output and see the similarities. As you can see, there seems to be a direct mapping of statements in the program to this intermediate representation. So the important part here is that we're not losing any of the information that we put in on the left side. And that's basically the big invariant for our DSL. We want to make sure that every information we can get from a domain expert, we keep. In this case, though, this is quite a lot harder to look at than the left, but it allows us to do a few optimizations. One of the most important ones that we do is based on mathematical identities. As Hieronimo already introduced, um, this is important in order to get the best performing code and that is usually very hard to figure out for a general compiler. Now, this happened in the next step which was running a domain optimization pass. Specifically, it's this one, which is factorizing of contractions. Now, this uses the fact that when we have a contraction that is based on a product, we can use associativity and distributivity of the outer product and the contraction operator to turn this into a sequence of contractions of smaller rank and smaller sizes, meaning less computational complexity. You see the results on the left, where you now have three contractions but they have smaller arguments, smaller products. As you can see, these types got a lot smaller than what we had in the end. Now, this is harder to look at. And if we were to say to a domain expert, you're supposed to make sure that this happens, this wouldn't be the right way. We wanted a more interactive way. But remember that this has a one-to-one -one mapping to the CFD Lang language. So I've done something that's not strictly required to run this flow, but it's useful in this case, and that is to intercept the DSL again by converting this back into DSL code. And so we can actually look at what the result of this transformation looked like as opposed to what the input was.
So except for some reordering of the declarations there, you can see that the parenthesization changed, which is exactly what we would expect from this kind of identity transform. So this arguably could be presented to the domain expert as long as they're familiar with the DSL, which is a skill that they require anyway in order to be able to do this. And we hope to provide this for most things we can do in the domain specific part. Leaving the domain specific part, we need to get into a few details of the framework that we've chosen. Because we've chosen MLIR, the next thing we need to do is we need to make an implementation for this domain dialect in something that can actually be generated. In this case, I've opted to go for the Linux dialect. Now, you saw the optimized code already, but the output of this code after lowering to Linux is already a lot more complex than what we had on the left and a lot more concrete with all the types fixed. In fact, it is more what you would expect an uh, implementation of this to look like if you were to do it in terms of calls to an optimized library like BLAS. In fact, that is something that you're now able to generate from the right representation if you wanted to. Now we are going to CPU and we're going to have a naive implementation in that regard. So that's not what we're going to be doing. The easiest output we can produce is by lowering this further via the affine dialect and the standard dialects to reach something that is lowerable to LVMIR, which is what happens in the last stage of the demo. This is now CPU specific. We go this step and then the next step is turning this from a fine into an actual LVMIR file. And then we can use the existing LVM infrastructure, obviously also its optimizer to then output the code and that optimizer could then use strip mine or something else to do vectorization here in case that's not something that we encoded in the trend uh, transforms before. Now that ends us up with the hamholz.o file and that is what we need to link into our application and then we're done. So I've now compiled the app again and I can run it and it's going to perform some basic validation but that basically concludes the demo. Now I'm going to hand over to Geronimo again to summarize everything we did. And I hope you enjoyed the small demonstration. Okay, wait, welcome back. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the, the practical part by Felix and Carl. Let me summarize what we have seen today in this webinar. Um, first, so what we were trying to motivate here is that we need um, DSLs to tame this ever increasing complexity of systems. And we looked at uh, two particular things that we are looking into this project. Uh, one is this um, coarse grain heterogeneous irregular data flow graphs. And the other one are um, abstractions for um, mathematical expressions that you find in the mix. Um, right, so I hope you can, you can understand that with this abstraction, you can really improve productivity because these this this languages or these programs are easier to write as if you had to write them uh, with the, an HDL uh, in mind, or with pragmas for HLS, or with uh, or doing yourself all the synchronization between um, the execution of data flow actors on shared state, right? Um, so we believe that high-level semantics like this are key for targeting emerging systems, emerging accelerators, and that goes beyond what we're looking into Everest, as I'll discuss in, in a second. So moving forward, um, I mentioned semantic preserving transformations. I think this is very important because you don't want the programmer that is using a DSL to have to be confronted with errors that happen at lower levels of abstractions, right? It's like if today you would write C code and you have to go and debug the assembly code that is produced by the compiler, that's, that's not beautiful. We want to be sure that we're generating correct code. Um, we are in the process of just integrating everything like what we're doing on this smaller parts of an application and integrating that into the larger use cases um, to see how that, that, that pays off in, in, the, in the overall case. Um, we are, as we mentioned before, looking into this MLIR-based infrastructure for better reuse so that our abstraction can be reused by others and that we can also profit from abstractions that are already there. And, and one thing that uh, in my group we're very interested in is also looking into emerging POSIMOS in memory computing and even more um, exotic kind of um, target systems. And also for that, I believe that um, these high level abstractions are really useful, right? If you wanna target, for instance, a membrisive base crossbar array 
to accelerate machine learning computations, it is easier if you know what kind of computations you have and what kind of transformations you have to do in those computations to be able to fit into those arrays. All right, and so these are things that we're working and are part of our future work. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I guess congratulations if you made it until the end of this webinar. Bye-bye.